Good evening, everybody. All right, we're going to sing a song, a hymn that we should all know. And I'm going to ask if you can stand just for the hymn portion of this. A shelter in the time of storm. Here we go. The Lord's our rock. The Lord's our rock. In Him we hide. A shelter in the time of Oh 
Let's sing it. Hallelujah. Alleluia. when I die. If you do a Google search of this question, I did it earlier today, I got 699 million hits in 0.06 seconds. And so this is a question that we not only wrestle with in the church, but the world is asking this question. What happens when I die? Is anyone curious about that? Obviously you are because you wouldn't be here if you weren't. So I believe that the Bible gives us a good answer as to what happens to us when we die. Because you'll find a myriad of ideas out there. Before we get into our, our, our study and our message this evening, let us say a prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful that you are our God. And as we sang earlier, Lord, we are so grateful that death could not keep you in the ground. That we serve a living God. And tonight, Lord, as we delve into this question of what happens when we die, Lord, we pray that your, your Holy Spirit will, will guide us, Lord. And help answer this question. So that when we leave this place, Lord, we will have confidence of not only what happens to us when we die. But we will not fear it. And we can walk away from this place confident and bold, knowing that there is more to this life and we don't have to fear death. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I play video games. I, I, you probably won't hear a pastor admit that, but I do. Maybe it's because I'm a millennial. Yes, I play video, game, video games. I grew up with video games. I don't play as much as I used to, but I play video games. I remember Atari. Anyone remember Atari? Okay. I see one nod over here. Someone is brave enough to admit that. I've gone through the whole Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Genesis, Sega Genesis, all those other things, all the way up to the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Now some of us will be like, oh man, he's gonna talk about video games. Here's the point. What I have here is what we call a continuation screen. Whether you play Fortnite or World of Warcraft, if you die in a video game, you have this option of whether to continue your game or you could start new. And in some games, you are a disembodied spirit looking for your body and you are resurrected in the body that you have or lost. And it's not just in video games that we have this. One of the biggest shows, or now is declining in popularity because of, pe of favorite characters dying, Walking Dead. Anyone familiar with Walking Dead? 
Okay, no one, no, again, no one's brave enough to admit that. I, I know that there's a camera, but no one's going to judge you much. I'll be the first one to take the plunge. But we have this fascination of what happens to us when we die. And Google corroborates that. Everyone is wondering what is going on, what happens when I breathe my last? Am I going to be a disembodied spirit that ascends to a, a high place or a low place? Am I gonna go to a nice place or a burning place? Or is it gonna be nothing? Several nights ago at our first meeting, we talked about sin and salvation. We talked about how all of us here are messed up internally. We, we inherited this bent towards, uh, towards sin, which is more than just things that we do. It's, a, it's an inner condition that we all wrestle with. And last night we talked about how God through the sanctuary model showed us how exactly not only is he gonna forgive us of sin, but how he's going to cleanse us of sin. He's going to take sin out of us so that our relationship with him can be reconciled. And the heart of the issue when it comes to salvation and the plan of salvation boils down to what was broken in the Garden of Eden, which was trust. And so I want to go back to the Garden of Eden, and I want to explore this question, or rather this controversy. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. God is telling Adam and Eve because he created them in his image, meaning that he gave them the capacity for the freedom of choice. And he gave them this option, if you eat the fruit of this specific tree, this one tree in a garden full of all these trees, if you eat fruit from this tree, you will certainly die. Okay? And then we see another player in this game. <coughs> The serpent that we know as Satan then said, you will not certainly die in the next chapter in Genesis chapter 3. So the question then was, who will you believe? So the issue tonight that I want to wrestle with, I'm going to be really, really transparent with you. I understand that many people have very strong feelings when it comes to death. But don't take my word for it. I want you to really wrestle with what God is trying to tell you and determine whether it is you want to believe in what he says or what everybody else says. Is that fair? It's not what I am telling you. It's what God is telling us. All right, so here's some thoughts to consider. Much of the Christian world believes death, and more than just the Christian world, believes death is merely a walk a door to walk through to the other side of eternal life. If this were true, then death is not death, but a passage from life to a more abundant life. In other words, death really isn't death. It's just a step into another phase of existence. But what sense does that make then? Is there any teeth to what God said? If you eat this fruit, you will, you will die. Notice this too. If death is merely a passage of life to a more abundant life, then we're actually saying that Satan was right when he said, you will not certainly die. Think about that. God said, if you eat this fruit, you will certainly die. And the devil says, no, you will not die. Now let's continue on. This whole concept of immortality what is immortality? Let's define some terms. The term immortal means the inability to die. So if you are immortal, you cannot die, which then begs the question, who is truly immortal? 1 Timothy 6 verse 16 tells us, he that is God alone can never die. Now, unless I don't understand English, it says he that is God alone can never die, meaning that God is the only being in the universe that cannot die. Because Ezekiel later tells us in 18 verse 20, the person who sins is the one who will die. When we talked about salvation on Friday night and last night as well, we learned that every one of us has sinned and fallen short. Therefore, if we all sin, the penalty is what? 
is death. And every one of us here has had someone close to us or someone that we know die. Death is a universal reality for all of us here. And so, here in the onset, let's be very clear. Immortality means that you cannot die if you were immortal. But for those of us, if we're all human and all of us have sinned, that means we all die. So let's wrestle with this contradiction. If I die, but it's not really death, it's just a phase into another existence, I don't really die. I mean, as is telling you that I'm actually immortal. So what is wrong with this picture? This is actually a contradiction. The Bible continues to tell us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and this, Romans 2 verse 7, He, that is God, will give eternal life to those seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. So, we are not by nature immortal. As a matter of fact, it's God who is immortal, and God is the one that is going to give immortality. And so, again, we have to ask ourselves, who are we going to believe? popular culture, popular media, or are we going to trust what God has to say? There's two views of human nature. The first view is something that is actually very popular in, 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 in Christ, most of Christianity today and in the Western world, which is the dualistic view, a Platonic Greek philosophy that contends that humans are embodied souls. In essence, the soul is essentially imprisoned in the body. So let me put it this way. A soul would be like that, that water bottle that you have there. And then the soul would be like the water that you put in there. And so the water is trapped. That would be the soul. And so when we die, what they're teaching is that the soul is poured out of the body. It is free. That is what the dualistic philosophy teaches us. And then there's the monastic view, which teaches us the body, soul, and spirit are indivisibly one at creation, at birth, throughout life, at death, and in the resurrection. Meaning that there is no such thing as a division of body and soul. If we were to look at that body, we look at it as a whole and not in part. We see this in, again, this is something that we inherited from Greek philosophy. And I'm going to show some things from those philosophers that we actually learned in our school system. Plato, for those of you that stayed up in philosophy class, in his book, Phaedo, or in other words, On the Soul, this is what he said. The soul is in the very likeness of the divine, and immortal, and intelligible, and uniform, and indissoluble, and unchangeable. And he continues by saying this. It goes away to the pure and eternal and immortal and unchangeable to which she is kin. Death is merely the separation of the soul and the body. This is Plato, a Greek philosopher. And he also records the death of Socrates, which is another philosopher in Athens. This is what Socrates said before he died because he had to take poison. Be of good cheer. And do not lament or cry about my passing. When you lay me down in my grave, say that you are burying my body only and not my soul. That's interesting. Werner Jaeger, he wrote this article in the Harvard Theological Review, The Greek Ideas of Immortality. He said this, the immortality of man was one of the foundational creeds of the philosophical religion of Platonism that was adopted by the Christian church. In other words, it was not something that was original to Christianity, it was something that was adopted into Christianity. Because if you read scripture, and if you read church history, and history in general, Christianity began in Jerusalem, it began in, the, in Palestine, in Israel, but as as Christianity spread because of persecution and because of gospel proclamation, it entered into different lands. And as they entered into different lands, Greece, 
uh, as you know, was a world power at that time, which influenced the Roman Empire. And so Greek philosophy was taught widely throughout the Roman Empire in which the young Christian religion was spreading. And as you know, ideas start to filter in. And this was one of the ideas that was adopted by the early Christian church. And I want you to see how this is actually continued to be taught in popular Christianity. Does anybody know who Billy Graham is? He's one of the most popular uh, evangelical preachers. He, he was one of the most famous evangelists that would fill stadiums full of people and he would call them to accept Jesus and people would come down weeping. He, he is still a model of evangelism today. Look what he says here. You are an immortal soul. Your soul is eternal and will live how long? Forever. In other words, the real you, the real you, the part of you that thinks, feels, dreams, aspires, the ego, the personality, will never die. He continues, continues by saying this, your soul will live forever in one of two places, heaven or hell. Whether we are saved or lost, there is a conscious and everlasting existence of the soul and personality. Billy Graham wrote that. Billy Graham taught that. And as we have learned from the scholars that wrote in the Harvard Theological Review, that philosophy, that understanding was not natural to Christianity. That was something that was brought in and accepted and that is still being taught today. There is a conscious and everlasting existence of the soul and personality. So what is the biblical definition of the soul? What is the biblical view of the soul? That the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils and the man became a living person, or in other versions, soul. So let's look at the math here. I know that some of us are in school and some of us haven't been in school for a long time, but let's look at this equation. Dust plus breath of life equals a living being, person, and soul. So if you were to break that down, a soul is dust and the breath of God. And so a soul is not separate from us. We are a soul. Does that make sense? I see glazed eyes in the room. It says here, what makes up a man, according to scripture, is dust and God's breath that makes us a soul. Okay? So then, continues. Genesis 3.19, for you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. For then the dust will return to the earth, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Spirit can also be translated as breath. And so whatever animating power that God gave that dust will return to him, but the soul will then dissolve. So what is death? For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. For then dust will return to the earth, and the spirit will return to God who gave us. So the equation is dust minus breath of life will equal death. And so the opposite of life isn't continuing life, the opposite of life is non-life, cease of existence. So here's some observations I'd like to share with you. God alone is immortal, therefore the belief of an immortal soul is a contradiction. It has to be a contradiction. God can't say one thing and do another, that's a contradiction. God is very consistent, God is very logical. In fact, the Jewish encyclopedia on the immortality of the soul, I remember most of the Bible is the Old Testament, as we call it today, and it was written by primarily a Hebrew-speaking, Jewish-thinking audience. And most of the early apostles were Jewish, and most of the early church were Jewish. So this is what the Jewish encyclopedia has to say about it. The belief that the soul continues its existence after the dissolution of the body is nowhere expressively taught in Holy Scripture. The belief in the immortality of the soul came to the Jews from contact with Greek thought and chiefly to the philosophy of Plato. 
And so the Jews themselves, who are not Christian, in this observation say in their own encyclopedia that this belief that when we die, our soul goes somewhere else, that is found nowhere in the Holy Scriptures. And they acknowledge that this thought came in from the Greek philosophy of Plato. Here's what the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says. We are influenced always more or less by the Greek Platonic thought that the body dies, yet the soul is immortal. Such an idea is utterly contradictory to the Israelite consciousness and is nowhere found in the Old Testament. And if it's not found in the Old Testament, I can guarantee you it's not found in the New Testament either. Many of the early Christians found particular attractions in the doctrines of Plato, that errors and corruptions crept into the church from this source cannot be denied. So here's how it works. It's not as if the early Christians just suddenly adopted this doctrine into mainstream practice. It was something, as it says, it crept in. It crept in because it was what everybody else believed, and in their and the early church fathers, if you read their writings, in order for them to try to make some sort of connection with the philosophers of the day, they said, you know what? We'll take a little bit of this and make it a little bit more appealing to you and make it, make it seem more sensical. And so over time, from the first century, second century, and third, fourth, and onward, this idea of the immortality of the soul came into the church. And I know that that is something that many people believe, whether they are Christian or not. If we find it in our movies, we find it in our media, we find it in all forms of, uh, of media, that when we die, that's not it. We, we continue on another plane of existence. Now this may seem harsh, this may seem hard for some people to accept, because I know that many good people I have buried and they don't, they have this belief that, okay, Johnny or Sue is in a better place. I'm not here to tell them that they're wrong. It's not me telling you this. We have to determine again, remember, trust was broken in the Garden of Eden. And the first lie was, you're not going to truly die. You're not certainly going to die. And so, Many people have bought into this lie, and just because it's well-meaning doesn't mean it's true. And that's a hard thing for us to accept. Furthermore, here's some further observations. If one continues to live after death, why is Christ's gift eternal life? Have we ever thought about that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not what? Perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Then that's a contradiction. If we die, really, what is the use of Christ's gift of everlasting life? It makes no sense. Here we go. Mark 5, verse 39. He went inside. This is the story of Jesus and he was asked by Jairus, who was a, a leader in Jerusalem, to come and heal his daughter, right? And he, on the way, he healed the woman who was bleeding for many years, and he, he, it took him a while, and then finally, the child died. And the father was like, you don't have to come anymore, she's dead. And then Jesus goes into the house, and this is what he says. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. What on earth is Jesus saying here? In one of the more famous passages in the book of John, Lazarus was his friend. Jesus spent a lot of time with his, you know, Jesus had friends. He didn't just have disciples. Jesus had friends. These were his homies. These were the people that he kicked back when he wanted to retire from all the criticism that he was getting from the people. These were the people that he would go to and, and just be like, yo, I got to chill because these people are just getting on me. Lazarus was one of his best friends. And he was out doing his thing, preaching and teaching, and there was a messenger that came and said, Lazarus, your friend is sick. But Jesus waited, and he waited, until finally 
Lazarus died. And finally, Jesus made his way over to their home. And Mary and Martha, who were also close friends, they were, they were despondent, as you understand, if you had ever lost someone to death. Lord, if you were just here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. What? His disciples were like, no, no, wait a second. No, he's dead. And Jesus is saying, no, he's What on earth is Jesus saying here? What is he talking about? Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 10. I know I'm going through a lot of verses. The living at least know they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, nor are they remembered. Whatever you do, do well, for when you go to the grave, there will be no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom. And so Ecclesiastes is written by a King Solomon who was one of the smartest men, according to scripture in the world. He's saying that the living, at least they are conscious and they recognize, we all recognize that one day we will die. Whether we will die of old age, whether we will die of cancer, whether we will die of speeding on these back roads. I feel like I'm going to die on one of these back roads one day, but we all are conscious that we are going to die one day. But the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, no are, nor are they remembered. Whatever you do, do well. So whatever it is that you have to take care of, take care of in this life. For when you go to the grave, there will be no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom. In other words, when you die, that's it. So further observations. Jesus considered death as sleep. Now when you sleep, are you conscious of the time that passes by? I mean, I know that we dream when we sleep, and I know... Some of us have strange dreams, but when we sleep, state of you don't know what's going on. You, you're not conscious to the world. So then sleep then is a state of unconsciousness, and everyone who dies enters this state. So when we die, and as we learned earlier, once the breath, once the animating power of God is gone, we are just dust. I don't know if you're morbid enough to open up a grave of someone that's been dead for a long time, but their body has been reduced to dust. So here's some thoughts to consider. What is the purpose of the resurrection if everyone goes either to heaven or hell. Have you ever thought that through? What on earth is the resurrection for if we all go either to heaven or hell after we die? I mean, let's follow the logic through. If Jesus said that I am going to come again, as we discovered last night, Jesus said that I will return for you. If we already go to him, who is he going to return for? What's, I, 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 I wrestle with that. And furthermore, if the resurrection of the body isn't necessary for the soul to keep existing by itself, then Christ's death on Calvary was an unnecessary waste of suffering. Did you catch that? Because in the resurrection, the way that the Bible teaches it, and a lot of Christians do accept this, the resurrection is the bodily resurrection. However, if the soul is indeed separate from the body. If Christ at the, at the second coming is going to resurrect the body, that means he's going to have to pluck the soul out of heaven and put it back in the body. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't know about you, but if, if I'm in heaven, you know, playing a harp or doing my thing up there, and Christ is just like, hold on for a second. I'm gonna go back to earth and resurrect your body. Uh, why? I was already there. And furthermore, when Jesus finally did get to Lazarus' tomb, he went to that grave and he cried because death does affect God. Death was never in his plan. They told him to roll the stone away. And in his words, he said, Lazarus, come forth, come out. And Lazarus came out. And I imagine that if Lazarus was yanked from heaven, 
I'm assuming that he was in heaven, and thrown back into his body, he probably would not have been a very happy person. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's like I was in bliss and now I'm covered up here. I say that not to jest, merely to provoke thinking, critical thinking. If the resurrection of the body isn't necessary, if the body is merely a trap for our souls, then we wouldn't need to take care of our bodies. Think about that. We could go and do everything we want with our bodies because it is just a prison, it's just a trap, and then my soul is going to be released. No. Christ's death on Calvary was not just the salvation of a body, it was salvation of us as human beings, as souls. First Corinthians, this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, but tell me this, because he was actually dealing with these issues already in the first century from churches that he planted. Listen to this, but tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. See, Paul was already dealing with these issues. So, William Tyndale, he was a reformer. He said this, I marvel. Marvel meaning I'm surprised. Like, wow, what? A I marvel that Paul had not comforted the Thessalonians with that doctrine and mortality of the soul, that the souls of their dead had been in joy as he did with the resurrection, that their dead should rise again. In other words, he's, he's scratching his head, he's trying to think, this letter to the Thessalonians where he told them that they, they would see their loved ones rise again, why didn't he comfort them with, you know what, they're already in bliss. Why didn't he do that? He continues by saying, if the souls be in heaven in as great glory as the angels after your doctrine, show me what cause should be of the resurrection. Again, he's, he's trying to figure out, okay, if we're already up there, why does Jesus need to come again and resurrect us? This was, this was the Reformation where they were trying to wrestle with all of these, these, these errors that crept into the church. And he's asking these questions that I hope that we're asking ourselves as we wrestle with this own question. This. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, when the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. In other words, all of us are like perishable food. We can be put in the refrigerator and we can last a little bit longer, but eventually all of us like spoiled food is going to be bad eventually. It's going to decay. It is going to rot. What God is saying here through Paul to the Corinthians, when the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, it is not just the canned food that is imperishable, even though they can last for 20 years, the mortal with immortality the mortal with immortality. In other words, the mortal can die, but the immortal cannot. He is saying that only in the end. And again, immortality is a gift from God. That is when death is finally going to be defeated. If we are just a soul and a body, and when we die, we go to heaven, then when can we truly say that death has been defeated? Because then there will be no need of a resurrection, and there will be no need for Jesus to come again because we're already going to him. Think about that. He says, I'm going to come back for you. But a large part of what we see today, including in mainstream Christianity, is that, you know, when I die, I'm going to you. So who's right? Who can we trust? Jesus, when he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming back to get you. It's like, you know what? You can stay there, Jesus. You can continue to custom make my mansion, but when I die, I'm going to you and enter Peter's gates. None of that is found in scripture. And the deeper question that we have to ask ourselves is whatever, what we teach, or rather what we believe says a lot about our God. You get what I'm saying? So if we are saying that when we, if there is death and 
Death is the cessation of life. The soul cannot be immortal because only God is immortal. God then would be a contradiction. If we're saying that our bodies are prisons and our souls are the ones that leave, what's the problem with Jesus coming back, resurrecting our bodies? It makes no sense whatsoever. And the hope that we have in Christ because he came and he died for us and his gift of everlasting life, we're telling him, well, okay, that's nice, but I, I don't need your gift because I already live forever. This, Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, and I'm closing soon. Brothers and sisters, this is Paul. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who, what? Sleep. That's not Paul's theology. That's Jesus <laughs> informing this thought. Those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. He's saying, I want, I, I want to tell you, I'm, I'm telling you this because everyone else, the way that they look at death, the way that, that we fear death, I don't want you to be like them because you have hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have what? Fallen asleep with him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are what? Left, okay? Who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, we won't go to heaven before those who have fallen to sleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and the, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will what? will rise. We'll rise first. After that, after they are raised, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. In other words, we're not there yet. The people that have died and are buried, they're not there yet. The only time we are going to be with the Lord is when he comes at the second coming and when those who have died with the Lord are resurrected and the scripture tells us that we are going to be joined with those who are resurrected and then we will be with the Lord forevermore. Martin Luther, his biography and his words were, were captured by this um, biographer. Dr. T.A. Cantonin, he said this, Luther, with a greater emphasis on the resurrection, preferred to concentrate on the script, scriptural metaphor of sleep. For just as one who falls asleep and reaches morning unexpectedly when he awakes, without knowing what has happened to him, we shall suddenly rise on the last day without knowing how we came into death and through death. And I love this, it's beautiful. We shall sleep. We shall sleep until he comes. Knocks on the little grave and says, Dr. Martin, get up. Then I shall rise in a moment and be with him forever. I think Martin Luther was on the right path. My parents always wanted a baby boy. And they tried, and they tried to have a son. The first time they got pregnant, it was a boy, but several months down the line, there was a miscarriage. After that, they tried again, and then it was my sister. And they were like, we, we would like to try again and have a boy. And they tried, and my mom got pregnant again. And they got close to term. And they got there. Stillborn. And then they prayed, and my little baby sister at that time joined them. They prayed, please give us a, a baby brother. There's power in prayer, by the way. And afterwards, several years later, pregnant again with me. And I was born. And I was that baby boy they prayed for. My parents would tell me, you know, John, you have 
he would have had two older brothers. Would have had two older brothers. And they would, they would tell me things like, you know, you would probably have gotten hand-me-downs from your older brothers, and you probably would have been bullied. I'm like, is that an encouragement, or <laughs> should I be happy that they're not? But something that my dad always told me. You know what, John? One day, you are going to meet your baby brothers, your older baby brothers. I didn't get that. I was like, wait a second. But they're, they're not alive. That's true. That's true. But one day, one day, Jesus is going to come. And just like Martin Luther said, he's going to knock on the graves of your brothers. And your baby brothers are going to come running out to you. And you're going to meet them for the first time. Now, I don't know about you, if you have buried children, if you have buried fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and friends, I don't know about you, but what this Bible has taught me, what this faith has brought me hope, is that those who I have buried, I will see again. Right now, they're not being tormented by fires in hell or by things that they see from above in my life. They're sleeping. And one day soon, Jesus Christ is going to come again. And he's going to knock on those graves. And you are going to see them again. You are going to clasp hands with them. You're going to see loved ones that were ravaged by cancer in real life. And you're going to see them whole and new. You're going to see people that died of old age. And they're going to have new bodies. People that have been crippled or were born with no or, or missing limbs. They're going to be healed and whole. And they are going to be joining you and me in the clouds. And we're going to be with Jesus Christ forever. And I praise God for that beautiful promise. In video games, you can either start a new game you continue, or you could have the game remade into something better. I'd like to submit to you that there is no continuation after death, but the scriptures tell us that we will be remade. Our loved ones will be remade. What we see in this life, all the stuff that we go through, all the sickness that we go through, it is only temporary. And even when we die, it is just sleep. The moment we go into the sleep of death, one day soon we will wake up and we will see Jesus and we have no idea how much time has passed. And what this tells me, my brothers and sisters, what tells me, my friends, is that we don't have to fear death. So when this question comes up, what happens to me after I die? I can simply say, I'm going to sleep, and one day I will wake up again. But I'm not the only person that's going to wake up that day. My father, my mother, my grandparents, all of my family and friends are going to wake up with me if they have died in Christ. And in the morning, it's going to be more glorious than the twilight of life. Now, I don't know about you. But I love a God that has this promise and this hope for me. I don't know where you are, where you stand on your understanding of how we die, but the Bible teaches us a greater hope, a more beautiful morning. I don't know where you are. Maybe you're struggling with this. But the appeal is this. If you want to accept that our God is consistent, our God is gracious, and our God is coming for us soon, and that we don't have to worry about whether we are burning or looking at life terrible as it is right now. We are just going to sleep, and one day, we are going to see him again. Amen. This is what the appeal is. Do you want to accept that gift of hope that Jesus is giving us tonight? If that is your desire, don't worry. I'm not going to do a Billy Graham and have you come up to the front. I'm simply going to ask you to raise your hand as we pray. Father in heaven, I want to praise you that we, can, we have answers to these questions. And Lord, I know some of us have, have struggled with this. Lord, people all over the world are searching for answers. And Lord, I praise you that we have an answer. What happens when we die? Lord, we simply sleep. But Lord, that is not the end because your gift, Lord, is everlasting life. And your promise is that one day soon, Lord, that you are going to come again. 
and you are going to remake us. We will have new immortal bodies. No more sickness. No more cancer. No more radiation treatments. No more chemotherapy. No more ointment creams. Only life abundant and everlasting with you. Lord, those that have raised their hands tonight want to accept that hope tonight. And Lord, if they have further questions, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you continue to work with them and show them through your word that they can have confidence and trust in you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.